Hit that subscribe button and bell icon so you never miss an update from Neela Bakore Tutorials. In this part, we'll talk about the various modes of reproduction which are seen in animal kingdom. normally show two major methods or ways of reproduction that is asexual and sexual. Now when asexual reproduction takes place it can be in the form of budding, fission or even some special type of spore formation which is again a very rare thing. But in case of animals, the main method is sexual reproduction. When we talk of sexual reproduction, there are two possibilities. One, that the animals show sexual dimorphism. That means the males and females, they are separate and they have morphological differences. And the other possibility is that the animals are hermaphrodite. Hermaphrodite means one organism is going to have both male and female sex organs. So here male and female sex organs both are present in the same animal. But in order to favor cross fertilization these hermaphrodites again may show two uh, adaptations or two changes. They can be protandrous or protogynous. That means animal is hermaphrodite, male, female sex organs are present in the same animal. But the male gamete is formed first or male sex organ matures first. So that when the sperms or the male gametes are formed in the same animals, the eggs are not ready. So, there is no chance of self-fertilization. And in case of protogynous, it is the female sex organ which develops first. Let us take one example of each category. Protandrous is earthworm, leech, that means here we are talking about these two annelids, specifically leech and earthworm. And protogynous is seen in case of herd mania, which is known as sea squirt. So this is protogynous, female uh, sex organ will be maturing first. So egg formation will take place first. And because egg is formed, the male gamete in the same animal is not formed yet chances of self-fertilization can be completely avoided. So if sexual dimorphism is there, that is very good. Sex hormones are present in different organisms or individuals. And hermaphrodite means one animal has it, but these are the two adaptations which favor cross-fertilization. Cross now, fertilization can be internal, or external internal or external internal means it takes place inside the body of the female the male gametes are deposited in the body of the female and fusion of these gametes takes place inside the body and in case of external the male and the female gametes are released outside in the surrounding medium and fertilization is going to take place there this is normally seen in higher animals in frog-like animals, the eggs and the male gametes are released in water and fertilization takes place there. So, external as well as internal fertilizations are seen. Now, when we talk about the development, so when the embryo develops, the development can also be direct or indirect. Direct means what is formed from the egg is the organism. So egg directly produces the young. Whereas in case of indirect, what happens is from the egg comes out a larva. 
this larva changes into pupa and then pupa changes into the young one which grows into the other stage. Now this change from egg to young is known as metamorphosis. This is called metamorphosis. Now this metamorphosis can also be of two types. Normal metamorphosis is called progressive metamorphosis where the larval or the pupal stage is less developed. There are less specialized structures which are formed but as it grows towards the adult stage or young stage here then more and more advanced and specialized structures or organs are formed. Whereas in other case it is called retrogressive metamorphosis. In retrogressive metamorphosis the larva has more advanced structures which get lost as it changes into the young one. In case of tadpole the tail is present which is a functional structure but when this tadpole which is a larval stage of frog larva changes into pupa the tail gets reabsorbed. So a developed fully formed structure is getting reabsorbed. Same thing happens in case of herd mania also. So that process is known as retrogressive metamorphosis. So these are certain terms which we use when we talk about reproductive processes. Now let us talk about one more thing that is body temperature. Animals can be classified as homeotherms. Homeotherms means we call them warm blooded animals. These are warm blooded animals and what exactly we mean by warm blooded animals is they maintain their body temperature. So body temperature is maintained irrespective of what is the outside temperature. So if outside temperature is lower, that means it gets cold outside, the body temperature is still going to remain the same. And if outside temperature is very, very high, it gets hot, then also the body temperature is going to remain the same. This is in our case. So homeotherms are birds and mammals. Birds and mammals are able to maintain their body temperature for which we have adaptations. For example, if the outer condition gets very hot, we start to sweat. And when this sweat evaporates, it takes our body heat and it helps to cool down. If the outer temperature is very low, it gets very cold outside, then also we have adaptation like we reduce the blood supply to the skin so that less blood reaches to the skin and less heat will be radiated from this blood because blood helps in distribution of the heat. At the same time, erector muscles, uh, muscles which contract and that results into the body hair becoming little stick which we call the goosebumps. So this is our adaptation to maintain the body temperature. Some animals are not able to do that. They are called poikilotherms. Poikilotherms are commonly known as cold-blooded animals. Their body temperature changes according to the surrounding. That means if outer temperature increases, their body temperature also starts to rise. And if outer temperature falls, then body temperature also starts to fall. So they are cold-blooded. Body temperature is not constant. It keeps changing. But we know that beyond a certain temperature, our enzymes, our proteins are going to get denatured. So these animals also cannot let the body temperature rise. If outside temperature is say 48 degrees or 49 degrees, body temperature cannot be allowed to go there that high because all these enzymes will get denatured. So what happens is to avoid these extreme conditions, extreme cold and extreme hot, these cold blooded animals either they hibernate, so they show hibernation or astivation. Hibernation is commonly known as the winter sleep and astivation is known as the summer sleep. 
This means the animal gets into some uh, area, it could be like underneath a rock or in a burrow and stays there as long as this extreme winter is not gone by. So they avoid this extreme conditions. So because their body temperature can fluctuate, but we know beyond certain limits, it cannot fluctuate. So up to certain limit, they would let their body temperature rise or fall, but in winters, they would go for winter sleep or hibernation where they remain in a confined area with minimum metabolic processes. And same things these animals do when there is extreme heat and they go for summer sleep. So polytheotherms, they show these type of adaptations. So this is what we have talked of and it is under all introductory part. We have seen that animals can be classified on the basis of various processes, the body cavity, skeleton and everything. Now in the next part we will see the overall classification of the animal kingdom and then we will start with the phylum.